This stuff is brilliant. What we have here is a device that looks just like a standard large frame alternator, but in fact is an alternator on steroids. It's got up to 10 times the power output of a conventional alternator. It's got efficiency levels that are close to double that of conventional alternators. And it has unbelievably high levels of output at very low RPM, which is quite important, and we'll come back to that later. Now the question is, how do we manage to get this? Well, what we have inside of here is a combination of high-end automotive permanent magnet technology with conventional alternator technology. And we've got embedded permanent magnets inside of a normal alternator. The net result is we get all of the benefits at significantly less than the cost of automotive technology, which makes it affordable for boat owners. And we're also going to talk about the cable connections, but we're going to have to come to this one for that. With the high levels of power that we're getting out of this, even with high levels of efficiency, you're going to get a lot of heat. And in fact, all alternators get really hot. Uh, the vast majority of high output alternators in the boat world, when they're running hard, uh, get hot enough to where the cables that are attached to them do not comply with bow building standards. We've actually solved it in this case by using extremely high temperature cabling, special cabling for the, what's called the phase cables on this device. This uh, cable is rated at 200 degrees centigrade. If the installers, uh, th they simply cannot misconnect these. It doesn't matter which stud the phase cables go on, they can't screw anything up. And then we have one other set of cables that are powering up what is called the field circuit. And once again, it's impossible to do any damage by misconnection. Whereas with a conventional alternator, if you wire it up backwards, you blow out all the diodes and the, and the alternator is destroyed. So with the amount of power we have available to us, we can actually uh, cause significant problems with the engine, particularly at low speeds and at wide open throttle, we can overload the engine and uh, result in premature failure of the engine itself. So we have to manage this power in a way that's totally different to a normal alternator. So we can't just plug an alternator voltage regulator onto the system. We have to have a very sophisticated, fancy control system, which is what we have in this box. And uh, I'm going to talk about this in quite a considerable bit of detail on all the features that we've got in here. But before I do that, we're going to go to the whiteboard and get a better sense of exactly what's going on in the system as a whole, what we call the integral system. So here's the theory. With engines, we typically show power, which might be in horsepower, might be in kilowatts, doesn't matter. And then we show RPM. And with most of our engines in small marine diesels in recreational boats, the peak here is either 3,000 or 3,600 RPM. So then we can draw a power curve from idle speed, typically around 800, looks something like this. And that's our peak power right here. And then when we put a propeller in the boat, the propeller absorbs energy in a different way to what the engine makes it. So the propeller actually absorbs energy like this. And the only point at which the propeller fully loads the engine is at wide open throttle. In any other point below that, there's a considerable amount of surplus power available from the en engine. And then if we start looking at efficiency, we discovered that the peak efficiency on most engines is in a kind of area like this. So the net result is the propeller is never loading the engine to peak efficiency. And although this seems a little counterintuitive, if we add load to the propeller, we push this curve up here, the engine gets more efficient. And that's exactly what we're doing with our system. We input into the system the uh, maximum power, maximum speed, so we know what this point is. We draw the power curve, we draw the prop curve, we calculate where the peak efficiency is, and then we add electrical load through our generating device managed by the controller that puts us on a line between the two. So we are at this point, even on a uh, like a 40 or 50 horsepower engine, we've got at least, we can extract at least eight or nine kilowatts of energy. As we get down to the bottom end, it's going to taper off because if we try to fully load the system up, we're going to stall the engine. And as we get up to the top end, it's going to taper off because if we add eight or nine kilowatts up here, we're going to overload the engine, it's going to overheat and damage it. So we've got this very sophisticated management system that's built in where we can optimize the energy production at all times. And not only are we now getting our 
electrical energy at close to peak uh, efficiency on the engine, but we're also making our propulsion engine more efficient. So we're getting two benefits and no losses out of the system at this point. But it does require this sophisticated control system to make sure that we're managing the loads down here and we're managing the loads up here and we're not pushing the engine beyond some limits that are going to damage it in the long run. So now we'll uh, go back to the controller and look at that in more detail, all of the um, complexities and smart stuff that's built into it. This has got a ton of features in it and I can't remember all of them so I've got myself a little cheat sheet here I'm going to put down and refer to. The first thing to note is that it's brutally simple to set it up. We only have to input two parameters. We input the engine maximum power level, the engine maximum RPM, and from those two factors, the system can draw those curves that we talked about on the whiteboard, configure out the optimum way to run the system. So uh, there's very little setup time involved in it. Regardless of the engine size or make or type, it's very simple. The second thing to note is that we have two entirely different control algorithms within this black box because we're operating in two different conditions. One is when we're underway, which is when we want to harvest most of our energy, and the other is if we're forced to run the engine as a generator at anchor. Uh, so we have an entirely separate set of algorithms for that other mode of operation, and we'll talk some more about that later because that's very difficult to optimize for that, and we've managed to do that. Then within here, we've got what's called a three-phase rectifier. It's a high-performance one with very low losses through it. And that keeps down the heat and maximizes the efficiency. We have multiple information sources. We can bring into this J1939, which is the information that's running on most engine buses. We can bring in NMEA 2000, which is what's running on your navigational system. We can bring in uh, CAT cables. We can bring in USB sources. Uh, we can bring in can open, which is used quite widely in other industries. Uh, and if somebody comes up with a different communications protocol, we can bring it into the system. We can translate it into our language and we can bring the information that's carried on that network into the system. So we're operating with a mass of information in here that would absolutely not be available to any other uh, alternator regulator. We want to have extremely precise control over the system because we're operating at such high levels. We've got to react really rapidly to any kind of transients and power surges. Uh, so we're, we're operating in a digital version rather than an analog version, which most um, regulators are, and we're operating at very high speed. We're, we're sensing everything every 10 mi microseconds. Uh, so we can react really fast to change in the situation. We also, on the control side, we're outputting a voltage to the device that we looked at earlier to uh, energize it. We want to control that very precisely. The normal way an alternator does this is to tap off the output of the alternator so that voltage supply varies with the battery voltage that you're charging. In this case, we have an entirely separate power supply uh, which is constant the whole time and that gives us a much greater level of control over the system than you would get from a normal, power from a normal alternator regulator. Uh, the power supply itself absorbs energy so we've got ourselves a, a very efficient what's called a planar transformer. It's a different kind of technology to what you normally use in transformers. It gives us much more efficiency, it's less heat losses, it's more compact, and it's more reliable. We can track, if you have an electronically controlled engine, this is the first one we looked at, but not the second one, we can track fuel consumption. So we actually have a virtual fuel monitor in here, and we can tell you what your tank levels are, and we can tell you what your fuel efficiency is, and uh, we can let you see in real time how you can optimize the output of the system for peak efficiency. We've got extremely precise measurement of voltage and amps. We can measure voltage down to one millivolt. We can measure amperage down to two milliamps. We can measure up to 105 volts. We can measure up to 350 amps uh, through some custom sensing devices which we're going to talk about later. We have a powerful automatic fault finding and limp home mode. So if the system detects problems, it makes an assessment of how serious they are and it scales back the power output. And if they're really uh, serious problems, it goes back to a limp home mode. So at least you're not totally without power on the boat. We have a data logger inside here that's tracking every data point in the system and any fault conditions and storing those. And we can store months worth of data within the data logger and then 
we're going to have built into here or attached to it a unit where you can do remote diagnostics and troubleshooting. So if you do have a problem with the system, the, uh, the factory back in the UK will be able to log into it, tell you what's going on and help you to solve the problem. We have what's called predictive temperature control. Rather than waiting for the temperature to come up to a certain threshold and then reacting to it, we can see rising temperatures on the board or in the uh, generating device or elsewhere in the system and we can start to scale back the output um, to make sure that the, the problem, whatever it is that's causing the rise in temperature, doesn't go any worse. This is much more sophisticated than the normal kind of temperature management that you have. And then on the um, installation side, we have a pre-manufactured wiring harness. I mentioned uh, earlier you cannot misconnect it at the generating device. Equally, you cannot misconnect it at this end. It doesn't matter what terminal you put where. Uh, we've got different size studs for the different lugs so that, again, you can't misconnect any of those. And then we have just a simple plug-in for the uh, smart stuff, all the uh, networks on the system. So it's, it's a really easy system to install. We've thought, spent a lot of time thinking about the cabling and how to simplify it uh, and make sure that the installers can't get into trouble. And the last thing I would say is this whole system is unbelievably fault tolerant. One of my jobs has been to try and break it. Um, and I have done all kinds of fundamentally stupid things with it. I've run it up to full output, 8 kilowatts, and then I've open circuit the system. If you did that with a normal alternator, it would blow out all the diodes in the alternator, and you'd probably also get a voltage spike through the boat that would destroy your electronics. This thing just does nothing. Um, we've, uh, we've short circuited the phase cables at high lows, it does nothing. The system reacts so fast, and it is so fault tolerant and it just shuts down and uh, there's no problems from this and again this is totally different to a normal alternator insulation. So I think at this point we might move on from the controller to the batteries. So with the uh, kind of power and energy we've got available to us we can do some serious damage to batteries. So it's really critical that we know exactly what's going on at the batteries and we re react to that. So we've developed a a really neat little device which hangs on a battery post just the bolt to the post goes right through the middle of it it gives us really accurate current measurement amps and then in the side of it we can see these wires coming off we're measuring voltage at every block level so each one of the uh, batteries in the system we're measuring the voltage and tracking that and then we're also measuring temperature so those are the three key features that we need to know, amps, volts and temperature, and we're doing it at a very high level of resolution with a great deal of accuracy. And then all of that information gets fed back to the controller, and the controller can uh, manage the output of the generating device based on that. What we're also doing with that information is we're calculating the state of charge of the batteries in real time, and we can display that to the boat user. And we're also calculating how long the batteries can be sustain the charge discharge level that they're at. So we're giving you time to go. So if you've got a fairly high discharge level, let's say you're using a microwave or something, it will tell you you've got 20 minutes, an hour, two hours, or whatever time left at that discharge rate. If the discharge rate goes down, it'll tell you you've now got five hours at the, the next rate and so on. So we're giving the user a very lot of great deal of information. The problem with these sorts of devices typically is the more information you try to collect and the more sensing you do, the more the parasitic loads on the system because you've got to energize the device. So we've also spent an awful lot of time and effort in minimizing the parasitic load of these devices and we've got it down to minuscule levels, it's milliamps. And in fact, um, much of the time they turn themselves off and then they just switch in, have a look and turn off again if there's no activity going on on the bus. So uh, once again, we've got um, almost a decade of uh, R&D and trial and error in these devices and we finally got them to a point where we, we think they're well, wonderful and you, you're really not going to do any better than this. And then the last thing we've done is to make the cabling really simple, is that once you've wired it up to the battery block, you've put the bolt through the uh, current sensor, all you've got to do is plug in the data cable and that daisy chain from one device to the other if you have a bunch of them on the boat. So there's a single data cable that goes through the boat and back to the control system and back to the display panel. So the insulation is, is really, really simple. So with the, uh, again, with the amount of power that we've got available, if we tried to run this at 12 or 24 volts, we would literally need to have cables that were this fat around. 
Um, so what we've done is to raise the voltage on the system because the higher the voltage, the smaller the cables. Uh, and in effect, we're running this as a nominal 48 volts, which is why you see in all of these systems four batteries, because we've got four 12 volt batteries in series to get us to 48 volts. We've been testing all kinds of different battery technologies. Um, these are what are called thin plate pure lead batteries. These batteries have carbon doping in the plates, which changes the performance characteristics somewhat. And then we are also testing lithium ion. We have right now uh, one lithium ion bank on test. We have another one that just came in the shop yesterday. We'll have another one probably in the next couple of weeks. So uh, we're making sure that the whole system can be operated with any kind of battery that you want to buy. We're battery agnostic, essentially. If you tell us what battery chemistry you're going to use and what type of battery, uh, we can change a couple of parameters in the setup program and, and you can plug the batteries in and you're good to go. So finally now, of course, we've got a 48 volt battery bank and you're going to tell me, well, my boat runs on 12 volts or 24 volts. And you're absolutely right. So we've got to get from 48 volts to the, the uh, boat voltage, whatever it happens to be, 12 or 24 or both. So we've developed battery to battery chargers. So they go between the 48 volt bank, which now becomes your energy storage system on the boat. This is like a big tank of diesel, effectively. This is your electrical tank of, ele of electrical energy. And then we've got to step that down to your boat voltage, which is 12 or 24 volts. And then you're just going to have a small buffer battery at 12 and 24 volts, which is going to be permanently maintained in a full state of charge by the main battery bank through these battery to battery chargers. And the battery to battery chargers themselves are really smart devices which incorporate a lot of the uh, battery management and control algorithms that we've got in the, in the black box here. So finally, let's talk about that situation where we are at anchor for a couple of days. The batteries have gone down and we don't want to move the boats. So we're not interested in getting underway, but we need to charge the batteries and power up the system. We're now going to have to run what is effectively a highly powerful engine with a relatively small generating device um, relative to the overall power of the engine. And so there's a big mismatch between the generating device and the engine when we're in generator only mode. And in these kind of conditions, normally speaking, you would get extraordinarily inefficient operation in generator only mode. But we have an ace in the hole here. Typical generators, AC generators, have to run at a fixed speed. So in the, the States, it would be 1,800 RPM. Let's put a blue line in. In Europe, it would be 1,500 RPM. We'll put a red line in. So the engine has to run at that speed to get the right frequency. We're not going to get into why. Uh, the generator has to be sized for the peak load on the system. So it's got to be sized for a fairly high load. Most of the time, the uh, loads are way below that. So the generator is operating somewhere down here in a chronically inefficient part of the engine's, this is called a fuel map, engine fuel map. And in, in many situations, the generator is burning five to 10 times as much fuel as it would need if it was operating at peak efficiency up here. I mean, we're talking about really serious chronic inefficiencies. Because we're operating as a DC system, we don't have to run at a fixed speed. So we are able to operate down here. And because our generating device has been optimized for, to go to very high levels of output very quickly, at 800 RPM, we can get three kilowatts out of it. At 1,000 RPM, we can get five kilowatts out of it. So even with a 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 horsepower engine, we can load the bottom end of the uh, power curve more than a propeller can actually do it. And the net result is that we are getting efficiencies down here that are not far below what we'd get up here, and which are many times better than what you'd get from a standalone AC generator. Uh, and this was actually a core part of the development process, was to make sure that when you're in the standalone generator mode, we can be at least as efficient as the peak efficiency on a standalone generator. And in terms of uh, operating efficiency, we're actually way better than most generators, which is a pretty major achievement, to be quite honest. The, uh, we've spent a lot of time and effort trying to make the inter integral as close to a fit and forget system as we possibly can. Right now, the user does not need to interface with it whatsoever. If you crank the engine, it'll charge the batteries. If you're running with the engine in neutral, it'll know it's in standalone generator mode. It'll switch that algorithm. 
the only time it's likely to prompt you to do something is if you let the batteries get beyond a certain level of discharge, at which case the system will prompt you to crank an engine and put some charge into the batteries. But that's as far as the user intervention needs to go. On the other hand, uh, for the techies that want to have a lot of information and to see what's going on in the system, uh, we have a ton of information flowing through the system that we can display. Uh, so we have that option for those that want to use it. So over the years, we have probably spent close to $10 million in terms of grant money and uh, R&D money from uh, other people to get the system to where it is today. Uh, we've tested the crap out of it, to be quite honest. One of my functions, as I mentioned earlier, has been to try and break it. I've had the system on my boat all summer, that's several months. I've been working it really hard. Uh, I've been unable to create any fault conditions all summer, and I've done all kinds of stupid stuff that you would uh, not normally do, just to see if there are things that we've missed. So we're finally at a point where, where I'm comfortable that we're ready to go to market, and actually one of the things I said when we started this project was that I would in no way endorse a product until I had been able to test it very thoroughly myself to make sure that I thought it was okay. So you're probably wondering why we call this the integral. It's the intelligent generation of electricity. We honestly believe that this device is going to supplant generators on almost all boats that currently have or would like to have a generator. It's no more expensive than a generator installation and likely will be cheaper. It eliminates the generator altogether so you don't have the issues of the through holes, the cooling circuits, the uh, long running hours, the maintenance. Uh, effectively what we're doing is harvesting the electrical energy that you need to run your boat anytime you're running the propulsion engine. The engine already has that capacity, it's just not being used and we're using it. Uh, if you get to the point where you've run the batteries down and you do need additional electrical energy, then you simply crank the the propulsion engine uh, for a short period of time and recharge the batteries and during that period you are operating at least as efficiently as a standalone generator. As far as we can see the, the Integral has no downsides at all um, and everything in here is positive and what we are really doing is enabling people to, leave, to live a lifestyle on their boats that is much the same as they do at home. They have running hot water, you can stick an electric kettle on the boat, you can have a coffee machine, you can have a fridge and freezer, you can have a hair dryer, uh, you can all of, use all of these things without thinking about where the energy is coming from, and if you get to the point where you're running a little short on energy, the system will prompt you and you can go ahead and recharge the batteries. So uh, we see this as a game changer in the energy generation market. It's the piece of equipment that I have always wanted on my boat for the last 35 years uh, and have finally achieved and uh, it will get rid of all of those battery changes we've done over the years, wiping out batteries. Uh, it will provide us a seamless energy source that's good for years to come. And it's actually my retirement present to the cruising community.